Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on what time you're joining us online. Um, this is the Echo and Daily Post first debate of the general election campaign. And uh, today we have candidates from all three parties who are going to answer questions fielded by our readers. And uh, if they'd like to introduce themselves, we have... Hi, my name is Luciana. I'm the Labour and Cooperative Parliamentary Candidate for Liverpool Wavertree. Hi, my name is Andrew Garnett. I'm the Conservative Party candidate also for Liverpool Wavertree. Hello, I'm Colin Eldridge and I'm the Liberal Democrats Parliamentary Candidate for Liverpool Wavertree. Right, first things first, we've had quite a lot of questions sent in by readers <coughs> um, and others from further afield, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, got one from Sheffield and one from uh, Whitley Bay here, so uh, <laughs> your uh, knowledge has better be expansive. First things first, um, this is from a gentleman called Martin. He's a teaching assistant and uh, he would like to know each party's policies on school budgets and whether he has anything to worry about in relation to who should next take power. Luciana, would you like to start? I think uh, we've seen here in Liverpool how much the Labour Party is committed to education in our schools. In, in Wavertree, we've seen every single school either rebuilt or refurbished. And we've seen spending on pupils double from 2,000 to over 4,000, which is fantastic. And with that, we've seen standards rise right across uh, not only the constituency but the city. It's the Labour Party that's committed after this general election to ring fencing education spending, uh, and that can only mean that for a gentleman that's put in his question that his you know his job's safe. Go on. Standards have risen, but it's all down to the Labour Party. Well, I, I don't necessarily say it's down to the Labour Party. I mean, the Liberal Democrats' policy of this election is what we're calling the pupil premium, which is to put about an extra two and a half billion pounds into schools. Rather than ring fencing it, as has been suggested, what we want to do is give it directly to the schools and let them spend it the, the way they think is best. Because at the end of the day, they are the people that know uh, what's going on in their school, what the issues are, and how to best spend it. We hope that they'll use it to bring down class sizes, because obviously the evidence is that where there are smaller class sizes, the pupils do better. Mm. Andrew? I don't think uh, your reader has anything to fear about from a Conservative government either. Uh, we're committed to... Um, driving up educational standards uh, in the coming years through freeing the teachers to actually teach. I think one of the scandals of the past 13 years has been that the Labour Party uh, came into power with the mantra education, 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 and we've seen educational standards fall across the last 13 years. One in four of our primary schools are um, nationally are failing. Somewhere in the region of 40% of our secondary schools are failing and 50% of pupils leave school with fewer than five GCSEs. We're about driving up educational standards to ensure that people can go out and get the best possible jobs in our economy and um, that they are capable of doing. Luciana, obviously both parties, uh, needless to say, don't think that uh, Labour have achieved quite as much as they'd like to think in the last 13 years. Are we going to be in a situation if another party should assume government where they just won't have the expertise and skills to, uh, to carry forward education in the way that Labour can, or is Labour running out of ideas? I don't think Labour's running out of ideas at all. I mean, uh, the, we saw from the leaders' debate last night that David Cameron couldn't answer the question about what was going to happen to education spending, and it's the Labour Party that has committed going forward to ensure that all our schools get the necessary, necessary resources that they deserve, and that young people right across our country, and particularly here in, in Liverpool, uh, get the education and the teaching that they need in order to uh, flourish. Mm. Andrew? Are the, are the Conservatives in touch enough to really know what uh, matters to uh, the people of Wavertree? I mean, we heard yesterday a Conservative uh, talk about how he thought the average family home began at about a million pounds. I mean, where, you know, where, is, where are these ideas coming from? Well, to be clear, I certainly don't believe that the average family home begins at a million pounds. I, right? I, know, I know it's somewhat lower than that um, around here and in many areas of the country. Um, we are in touch uh, with the electorate, both in Wavertree and across the country. We've been out working hard on the streets, talking to the people of Wavertree for a number of months now. Um, we're getting the messages from them as to what they care about, and what the people of Wavertree care about is actually what the Conservative Party cares about. Mm. We've got a manifesto uh, which addresses you know, the key issues in our society today, which are the broken economy, the broken society, and our broken politics, together with improving our public services, they appear to be what the people of Wavertree can care about, what the people of this country care about, 
and we're going to deliver on that for the benefit of all. Colin, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think anyone who remembers the Conservatives' policies in Liverpool in the 1980s realises that it's the same old Conservatives, frankly. The contest in Wavertree is a straight fight between Labour and the Liberal Democrats. And the question I think people have to ask is not just about individual policies, but the kind of MP they're going to send to Westminster. And certainly I believe that I can be a strong voice for the area to fight for a fair deal for Liverpool, because I think over the last number of years, Liverpool hasn't always had a fair deal. Right, well, I mean, that's, uh, that's the youth, obviously, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum. We've got a question here from Peter at Windermere Drive who asks, um, what assurances can all the parties give that the constituency's more senior electorate will not be victims of the swinging public service cuts? I'm obviously referring to the fuel allowance and free public transport travel. There is a need to overhaul welfare state to stop dependency. What is your party going to do to send a strong message to everyone that those who do not work shall not be handed benefits after six months when there's sufficient time for them in that period to get a job? So two, two issues really there first. I'll start with you, Colin. What can the Lib Dems do to make sure that the elderly uh, aren't the ones who suffer from the, uh, from the cuts that inevitably all parties, I think, are in an agreement will have to be made? We're committed to uh, make sure that the link between earnings and pensions is restored and to do that as quickly as possible because I think it's really important that people understand not just the support they're getting but what they're going to get moving forward so they can budget. Um, what I would say is that the, you know, there is going to be a big debate about the type of uh, cuts that are going to have to be made, the kind of uh, changes that need to be made in terms of the resources available. And the Liberal Democrats are the only party that are being completely frank about our spending commitments and uh, how we would pay for things. In fact, if you look at pages 100 to 103 of our manifesto, it's all laid out line by line, so that the particular reader can be reassured that in there, there all of our, our policies are fully funded and laid out. Andrew? Well, I mean, I think what Colin's just said isn't actually strictly true. If you look at the manifesto, there appears to be an 11.9 billion black hole, and in fact, at the end of the Liberal Democrat administration, we'd be 900 million, almost a billion pounds deeper in debt than we, well, the than we are, than we are, than we are, than we are currently you. today. Well, certainly the research that I've shown doesn't agree with what you've just said. Turning well, now to the question I'm in particular, which I think is, is probably a little bit more important than a, a, a dividing line between uh, Liberal Democrat and Conservative policy, we're committed to um, ensuring that the, the link between um, earnings and pensions um, is restored so that our older, um, older members of our society can, can share in the growth of prosperity of our society. We're committed to ensuring that uh, winter fuel payments are retained and that free bus passes are retained. We also want to look at our welfare system and ensure that people are given the, the targeted assistance that they need to get back into permanent employment. Mm. I, I'm not so sure there should be a hard cut off at, at six months, as your reader suggests. It may take longer to provide people, a person with the equipment that they need to get back into, into full-time permanent gainful employment, but that's certainly what our policies are driving at. Luciana, obviously, I think if... Um over the, I mean, only the other week, as one reader mentions, we saw a story about a family uh, living handsomely on something like £42,000 a year benefits. Can this carry on? Does the, does the genuine, hard-working person in the street, can they compute that, that this arrangement that seems to favour the uh, work shy, for want of a better word? As we've seen from the launch of our manifesto only a couple of days ago, you know, we have a very strong commitment to ensuring that... Uh, there is a return on people in work and that you must be better off in work and at least at the, ver the very least 40 pounds off better a week in work mm. and that anyone that's unemployed for a period of more than two years will be found work mm. um, if, they're, if they are capable if they're able to, to work if they don't have a disability and I think that's a very important uh, step forward we've made a, a number of reforms to our welfare system over the course of the past couple of years and you know when people hear these stories I can understand that there's discontent when it comes to Peter you know he's talking about he's a pensioner it is the Labour Party that introduced uh, winter fuel payments which means that you know we've just had one of the coldest winters uh, in history mm. and people I know you know really valued the fact that they had if they you know, over the age of 60 a 250 pound payment to help them with their winter fuel bills over the age of 80 400 pounds you know, it's the Labour Party that's promised to retain those winter fuel payments and it's other parties including the Liberal Democrats and the Tories that said different age groups you know they'll, they'll, well, we know from the Lib Dems mm. 60 to 65 year olds that's going to stop uh, well, that's and, not true 
Well, well the, the, the policy about 60 to 65 year olds is those in the greatest need would still receive the payment. What we've actually said is those people, like for example Mike Story, who's the head teacher of a very large school, his wife works, does he really need the winter fuel payments? We're going to take it off people like him because he's still in On the home. record, uh, Colin Eldridge is hoping to uh, scrap benefits uh, available to the current Lord Mayor of Liverpool. Just uh, so there's <laughs> Well, no, uh, I'm quite clear about this. People like that are in full-time work still and earn lots of money. We're going to take the, the, the payments away from them and give, make them available to disabled people, which is something the Labour Party haven't done. So Luciana can make the dig at me, but actually disabled people don't qualify for those payments at the moment, and it's the Liberal Democrats that's, that's committed to making sure they do receive them. But only some. Well, all disabled people would receive it. Right, but pensioners... But for the well, 60 to 65-year-olds, only those that are... Uh, qualify through the uh, benefit system would get them. Mm. So those people who are in full-time okay. work, for example, wouldn't. Andrew, what do you say? Has, uh, has Peter got something to be worried about uh, under a Conservative administration? Will the rich get richer and the poor poorer? Well, I mean, uh, I don't believe that the, the, the rich will necessarily get richer and the poor will get poorer under a Conservative administration. We, we, we've had a Labour administration for the past 13 years. We're going to tackle poverty, and in fact, we've seen people get dramatically poorer over the course of that time, and they've done nothing to address it. Um, I think it's about um, freeing um, business within our economy to ensure that it can generate wealth, so that people can get jobs, so that they themselves can become wealthier. And that's what we're going to be about. You know, we're going to look to cut um, corporation taxes in this country, which should enable. You know, employment levels to increase and investment levels into businesses to, 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 mm. to increase. We're going to kill Labour's job tax, which will stop the recovery dead in its tracks. That, again, will enable both the poorest sections of society and, to some extent, the richest se se sections in society to, to increase their overall levels of income. But what... Can I what? come back on that? Yeah, you will. Um, pardon? In a second, sure. I've just got to challenge you on something. But what... Um, what role does the Conservative Party see the state has to play in helping people back into employment? Because I get the impression that we have under the Labour government currently the Future Jobs Fund, obviously, which I'm sure Luciana will talk about. Um, seems to have been a successful policy, as far as we can tell. It's been extended. Even David Cameron seemed to uh, be uh, enthusing about it when I saw him the other week up in Everton. Um, what role do you believe that the state has in helping uh, particularly people who are out of work. We live in a... Uh, central to our agenda is the idea of a big society. We are all in this together. So we all have to work together to improve our lot. Um, the state can help. The state can, through the taxation system, provide the means for which local groups can come together to provide services for individuals, but at the end of the day it's local communities, society, charities that are going to make the difference here. I've, I've been spending some time recently with um, Captain Dave Sharples down at the Frontline Centre in, in Wavertree, mm. and what we're about is bringing through the next set of, of Dave Sharples, mm. empowering community leaders to really make the difference in our society. Sure. It's not the state that can do that. So Luciana, so the Conservatives, if I forgot this right, it's... Uh Big society, small government. Can that work, or do we need the state to be there for people when uh, you know when we're, when we're in a recession like now? I was speaking to uh, one of our current MPs in the area who said the difference between this recession and the last one is that the people weren't abandoned by the government this time in the way that certainly Liverpool felt it was then. What's your view? Well, I mean, it was Colin that said before that this city remembers what it was like to live under a Conservative government in the 80s where repossessions were double what they are now. Unemployment was double what it, was, uh, what it has been coming out now out of the worst global recession that we've ever seen. And it is because the Labour government has been committed to providing the help and assistance to people when they most need it. It's helping people through the good times and the bad times. And, you know, at this time, when we are coming out of a recession and we have a very fragile recovery, I do believe that we need a sustained period of four years, as we've set out in the budget and in our manifesto, to see us through the recovery. OK. Andrew, you look like you didn't quite agree. Well, I, 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 I didn't on. agree. I mean... <laughs> First, first, first of all, let's see, Colin. First we'll of all, I don't think the eighties are particularly Andrew, relevant to this debate. Well, well, the eighties are always relevant in Liverpool, I'm afraid. That's history Andrew, about where we're heading to. Well, history has a lot to answer for sometimes, doesn't it, Colin? What role? How, how do we get the balance right between the state, 
and uh, the population without one overwhelming the other? What's, what's the right mix for the Lib Dems, would you say? Well, I think the, the state's always got to be seen as a safety net. There are always going to be times when people fall on hard times, they, they have dif difficult personal circumstances, and the state needs to be there to help them. But I think it needs to be a, a help up rather than... Uh, currently, at the moment, there's obviously a, a group of society that perhaps you know, that they, they've uh, b become dependent upon the state and we need to try and move away from that and try and get people back into work and empower people to you know, run their own lives. Mm. So that the role of the state, I think, is something that needs to be obviously looked at and clearly the size of the state also um, needs review. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, I think we'll move on to our next question now. Um, <laughs> this one's an interesting one. Um, Peter, uh, he asks... Um, well, he tells us rather, uh, the law is not working or the police either do not have the resources or have concluded that burglary is not an issue that deserves real attention in relation to protecting one's property. When is your party going to change the law for people to be able to defend their property as in America? Uh, that will also release valuable police time for other duties. After all, your house is your castle and people will once again feel safe in their homes. I don't necessarily think he's advocating a change to the uh, gun laws, but uh, starting with you, Luciana, burglary is a, is a serious problem in certain parts of, uh, parts of Liverpool. Um, people do, I think, feel powerless in their homes, and sometimes when they're being told, oh, we'll, we'll get there and it's a couple of days before the police turn up, is this acceptable, or do these type of crimes which really affect people psychologically as well as financially, <coughs> has the government done enough to tackle this over the last 10 years, 13 years? Well, since 1997, when Labour came into power, we've seen uh, a decrease in, in overall crime. In fact, crime six, we've had six million fewer crimes uh, since 1997. And that's a result of the massive investment in the police we've seen right across the UK, and particularly here in Liverpool. We've got 300 extra police officers. We've now got uh, 16,000 police community support officers across the country, a number of which we see here. We've also got a safer neighbourhood policing team for every single community, including here in Liverpool, of which 80% of those uh, police people's time must be spent on the beat. You also mentioned that, uh, wrongly, forgive me, inaccurately, that uh, police might get back to you in a few a few days. That's not the case. They have to get back well, to you within think, 24 uh, hours. They might have to get back to you within 24 hours. Whether or not they turn up to actually see the crime scene as it stands is another matter. I'm sure we could raid our archives and find many an example of where that's been the case. But. Um, well, yes, I think, I I mean, histor historically, you know, there's, there's been lots of challenges that we've had to address. But I, I spoke to someone uh, in Kensington only two days ago who, unfortunately, had been burgled, and they said that the police couldn't have done a better job, and that they were there immediately in their home. They were with them every single day. Uh, for seven days, and they felt that the police had been a massive support. They made sure that their property was secured, and they were very grateful because they remembered being burgled 15 years ago, and their experience was very, very different. Andrew, what do you think? What do people <clears throat> do? People have a fundamental right to defend their own property, and should the law be changed to allow that? I mean, when I talk to um, talk to Chris Grayling, who's the shadow minister for for, 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 for Merseyside, one of the things that he he says he is absolutely fed up of is a homeowner being in a position whereby they seek to defend their home against a burglar and they find themselves up in court whilst the burglar is walking on the streets. If you use reasonable force, we have no intention and no wish to see you brought before, before the court system. Mm -hmm. And we're going to take action to ensure that that actually doesn't happen. Looking at the you know, particular fact set that, um, that, that, that your gentleman reader um, has, has, has brought to our attention here, um, you know, one of the, the, the problems that we have is, yes, that, that there may be some more police, but they're not actually out on the streets. They're spending their time tied up with bureaucracy. We want to free the you know, if, if, if a policeman stops um, a car with four people on it on Old Hall Street today, he's got five forms to fill in. Mm. How ridiculous. One for each passenger, one also for the car. We want to free the police from that bureaucracy so they can go out there and fight the crime. That's what all of the people in Wavertree are telling me that they are so desperate for. Mm. Colin? Well, the Liberal Democrats' uh, policy is to abolish ID cards and spend the money on additional policing, because I think, clearly from what your reader has said, actually having more police around on the streets is, a first of all, a visible deterrent. Um, secondly, when there is a crime, they can react much more quickly and, and, and actually be able to hopefully gather the evidence quickly to ensure that the crime is uh, solved uh, more rapidly. Um, 
In terms of the, tackling the issue around defending your own property, I personally think that people should have a right to use reasonable force to defend their own property. And I think that we've got to be very clear, though, about what reasonable force is so people understand where they, what they can and can't do. I certainly think that uh, the point that has been made about additional police in, in Liverpool and the current government funding formula for Merseyside Police means that Merseyside Police actually get £12 million less than they should do via the funding formula, and I think that needs to be reviewed to look at actually getting the right resources into the, the city. Is that correct, Luciana? Sorry. Is that correct, what Colin's just said about the funding formula? We, well, we, we, the, the figures speak for themselves. We've got 300 more police officers on the streets here in Merseyside, which must spend at least 80% of their time on the beat since 1997. But it's called, it, it, the formula system that the government use is a thing called floor damping, and floor damping means that Merseyside police have had £12 million less than the formula says they should get. And in fact, okay. Northumberland police had £112 million more than the formula says they should get. Mm. So what I'm suggesting is we look at that system again to ensure that, that extra 12 million mm. comes to Liverpool. Mm. I think Merseyside Police and the Police Authority would say the reason that there's more police is because they've been actually very good at efficiency savings to ensure that there's more frontline police officers. Okay. Now, oh, this is an interesting one. Um, I think you might have all escaped on this one because uh, it's not in your. Uh, your constituency. Prospective candidates never seem to go around knocking on doors anymore. Something which used to happen a lot in years gone by. Can we expect to see our candidates on the doorstep canvassing this time round? Well, obviously that's from James Mills in Aintree, so uh, <laughs> I'll have to take that up with uh, Councillor Rotherham et al. But um, are you all out and about? Is, uh, has the nature of campaigning changed for the better or the worse over the years? I mean, obviously now we've got the internet and uh, I'm sure we'll, before this election's out, I'm sure we'll see uh, a few people fall victim to the, uh, the dangers of e-campaigning. Um, what really reaches people best? Is it being out there on the street, on the doorstep, or is it, you know, being remote from people trying to reach them through, through different technologies now? I'll start with you, Andrew, on that. I think it's a combination of, 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 of factors. I mean, we've got a, an electronic offering on the, on, 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 on the, on, on the website, cityofliverpoolconservatives.org. Um, We've got um, people going out onto the streets, meeting people. We had a, a very, very successful street stall last Saturday in the middle of, the middle of Church Street, which got a great reception. We're also out on the knocker right the way across the city, talking to people about what matters to them. I don't think it's any one approach on its own that um, is, is, is going to enable you to connect with your electorate. You have to try a, a blended approach, and, and every method, including telephone canvassing, has its place in, in getting to talk and hear people's concerns. Mm. Colin, what do you think? I mean... Uh you, uh, well, well, if you had a choice between knocking on someone's door or uh, sending them an email, which one would you go for every time? Well, I'd definitely go for knocking on their door. I mean, we're knocking on thousands of doors, talking to people about the issues. I think the, thing that, the point to make about uh, the, 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 the reader's question is actually comes back to the electoral system. Because, of course, in Wavertree, it's a very marginal constituency, hotly contested. I know that all the candidates are working hard, they're, you know, putting out the leaflets, knocking on the doors, emails, etc. Because, you know, for us, every single vote, every minute counts. Mm. The, your reader lives in Aintree, which is perhaps a part of the, you know, as you suggested, it's in the Walton constituency, which is one that isn't going to be as hotly contested. Mm. And I think if we changed our electoral system, every vote would count. And so there'd be a lot more activity in some certain parts of the city and the country mm. where historically there just hasn't been because the same party always wins. Mm. Luciana, obviously, you know, we've, um, we've, uh, we've seen some uh, pretty uh, colourful campaign tactics, uh, I think, across all parties uh, so far during this uh, election campaign. What do you think? Is, the, uh, is web campaigning a blessing or a curse? My priority has been to speak to and meet as many people right across the way which you constituency as possible. I've been knocking on thousands and thousands of doors uh, since January when I was selected. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet people not only on the doorsteps of their homes, but also in their workplaces, at bus stops, uh, at school gates, trying to reach people where perhaps they wouldn't uh, have an opportunity to meet their parliamentary candidate otherwise. Mm. Does it get out of hand, though, when we have this situation now whereby... There's a lot of anonymity now in, in political campaigning that there didn't used to be. I mean, Colin, do you think, uh, you know, blogs, for example, they can, uh, they can cause a few headaches now and again, can't they? I mean, and even if they're not your own, when you have a, a, very, a party machine, you know, people get, uh, get linked to things that maybe they shouldn't. What do you think? 
should you be better off just speaking for yourself rather than you know have these legions of people uh, running the show who are ultimately faceless, can't be seen, can't be held to account? Well, I think that you have to understand that you know election campaigns are very big and broad and they've got lots of demands on the candidate. So simply to suggest that the candidate does it all themselves isn't really very really realistic. I think it, you know, there is a danger, obviously, in terms of blogs and emails and Twitter, Facebook, all these different uh, uh, ways of communicating with people. But look, I stand for what I believe in and I make myself accessible and available and open lots of doors, but anyone who wants to meet with me can do that. And they can hear firsthand from my mouth what I stand for and that would be what I stand and mm. fall by. Andrew, you, what do you think, just to close on that matter? Is, uh, where do you see campaigning going in the future? Are we going to revert back to the older fashion more methods, or is the internet just going to run away with it all? I don't, I don't think the internet's going to run away with it all, because at the end of the day we're all human beings, and we all like to interact on a one-to-one -one basis. So there's always going to be a place for um, you know, street-side meetings, hustings, for canvassing, there's also you know, equally a place for you know, ele electronic communications. Electronic communications will, will suit certain sections of the um, electorate better than a face-to-face -face interaction will. So it's going to be a mix and match approach. Right, well, that concludes the questions from the readers. So each candidate is now going to have a minute to uh, explain to us, the voters, why they should get your vote rather than the other two. So we'll start with, uh, start with Luciana. Well, thank you. Thanks for having us today, Mark. Um, I'd urge people at this election uh, to make sure that they use their vote. Every single vote is going to count. Uh, and the choice at this election is between a Labour government and a Conservative government. And people here, as we've discussed, you know, remember what it was like under a Tory government. It's the Labour government and it's the Labour Party going forward that is committed to ensuring that we come out of this recession into a secure recovery and that we look after all people in our society through that. Thank you. Andrew. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be um, in the ECHO offices. Um, this election is um, an opportunity for this country to change. We have at the moment a broken economy, a broken society, broken politics and public services that aren't working as well as they might. The Conservative Party has um, changed. Uh, we have a raft of policies that are designed to help all sections of our society, we're fully inclusive. Uh, we're keen to, to partner with communities in this city, up and down the country, to deliver what is best for Liverpool Wavertree. I am in this election uh, the local candidate. I was born and bred in Liverpool Wavertree. It's been a delight to be um, working in the constituency. And I very much hope that on May the 6th you will all put your trust in me and deliver the change that this community, Wavertree, and our country so desperately needs. Colin. Hi. Um, well, I'm, I live locally. Uh, I've lived here for a decade. I've been a local councillor. I've been involved in so many local campaigns. And I've also been a partner in a local business. So I think I know very well the issues that matter to people locally and the things that they want taken up in Westminster, the laws they want changing to help Liverpool get a fair deal. The Liberal Democrats at this election are standing on a platform of fairness and I think a fair deal for Liverpool is something that people will respond to. And I urge people to look at our policies because I'm sure the majority of people will support that. And I urge people to support me to be the local MP that will fight for Liverpool and get Liverpool a fair deal. Well, that concludes our web debate for the uh, Wave Tree constituency of Liverpool. Certainly, uh, it's been an interesting campaign so far and... Uh, as we approach uh, D-Day, I'm sure it will uh, it'll become even more interesting. So thank you for joining us. If you have any uh, comments or feedback on uh, what you've heard here today, uh, please feel free to email us at, uh, in fact, you can email me personally, mark with a C, dot waddington at liverpool.com. Thank you very much.